Hi everyone, Marianne Owen here. Greetings from Kodiak, Alaska. I'm excited to have you here and thank you so much. We have two fabulous topics we're going to cover today. And one of them, the first one, is going to be what I call, now call, four and six composting. Four steps to get finished compost in six weeks. The second one is, I'm calling, the SOS potato way, how to plant potatoes and maximize that particular bed. So let's get started. And um, if you have any questions, as in anything I'm covering, then feel free to put them in the chat and I will be covering them uh, towards the end. So let's get started and dive right in here. Today we're going to go through four proven steps to get finished compost in six weeks. These are techniques I've developed over 35 years of making compost in Kodiak, Alaska. So let's dive in. This will be a vertical format. I have written many articles and many papers and delivered many courses on composting. I'm going to show you the secrets of getting finished compost. So here we go. This is a basic diagram of the path to hot compost or finished compost. Food plus water plus air plus a home for the microbes, turning it and you can accomplish temperatures of 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 70 degrees Celsius. Now, thing is, compost is the single most important thing you can do for your garden, period. When you have enough of it, you won't need much of anything else. Now, keep in mind, ideal soil, ideal garden soil, is not all about adding more organic material. 50% of ideal soil is air and water. Only 5 to 10% max is organic material. The rest, ground up rocks and so on. But it's amazing that you consider that compost is made from materials that we might throw away. But there are many variables of making compost and things can go wrong. Maybe your pile doesn't heat up or your neighbor complains about the smell. So today we'll learn how to make compost right based on my 35 years of making compost. Remember, motion breeds clarity. So let's do this. Now this photograph you see here, <laughs> my, husband my husband's hands, he's holding finished compost that we've sifted from one of our three bins. And I'll show you that in a minute. So here's a story I wanna share with you. I went to a grocery store one day, and after seeing the prices for spinach and carrots and other produce, I stomped my foot. I was determined to grow more of my own food, yet I knew nothing about gardening, except that, hey, I needed dirt. I spoke to several of our local gardeners here in Kodiak, Alaska, and this is the basic answer. Marion, you won't find much garden variety soil around here, they told me. So. I called the Cooperative Extension Service in Fairbanks, Alaska for advice. Hi, I want to learn how to make compost. Can you help me? And the nice lady on the other end of the phone said, honey, it will take five years to get finished compost. I said, five years? This was February and it was snowing. If I wanted to eat lettuce in June, I needed to move quickly. So I walked over to the local library and there I read about Sir Albert Howard and the composting process he developed in the 1920s while he was working in India. When I read the following, finished compost in a matter of weeks, not years, my hopes soared. Even though I lived in Kodiak, Alaska, right? Not the warm tropics of India. That was back in 1985, and here I am turning my first 
compost pile. Pink scarf and all, and I am smiling from ear to ear because it's steaming and it's snowing and it's February. Nothing fancy here. I'm using pallets and two sides or a fence and that's it, nothing fancy. So I want you to be inspired here. So, after 35 years of researching and experimenting with different techniques and materials, I perfected a method where you can get finished compost in just six weeks. So compost is like making bread. It's part science, part art. There's no exact process, no hard and fast rules. Matter of fact, towards the end of this, I'm going to share bits of compost wisdom that I think you'll find quite inspiring. So just remember, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going. We're going to talk about how to make compost in four easy steps. One, gather ingredients. Two, mix your ingredients thoroughly. Three, add water as needed. Four, turn frequently. Now, we're going to go through these steps one by one. Number one, you want to gather your ingredients and think at the same time that microbes, which do all the work, are much like us. Their basic needs include food, water, and air. So there's no magic formula, no perfect blend of materials or ingredients. The most important thing is to nourish your hard-working microbes. They do all the work while you sleep. Then, as they break down the ingredients, your compost will heat up and the rest will follow. So, if you've been put off by complicated ratios of greens and browns, C and N ratios kind of things, relax. When it comes to food, microbes need protein and carbohydrates. It's just that simple. So, examples of proteins and carbohydrates, here we go. Protein, these are nitrogen rich materials such as grass clippings, animal manure, seaweed or kelp, even weeds that you pulled from the garden, green weeds, and food scraps from your kitchen. Carbs or carbohydrates, straw, old sawdust, cardboard egg cartons, newspaper, and leaves. Now, the photo you see here shows grass clippings mowed together with leaves. This is done in the fall. This is ideal as a combination goes for making compost. So, question is, how much nitrogen and carbohydrates do you need? Now, the exact amount of nitrogen and carbohydrates is not critical. Just a combination of ingredients that support the bacteria, food, water, air, and the fungi, which in turn causes the pile to heat up. As a general guideline, it's one part nitrogen to three parts carbs. One part nitrogen, three parts carbohydrates. Then, let experience teach you. That's the artistic part of making compost. Alrighty. To gather ingredients, grab some buckets, heavy duty garbage bags that you can reuse, a rake, a shovel, maybe some gloves, and you wanna go on a treasure hunt. So here's a sample recipe from a recent compost pile that I made. Leaves, grass clippings, coffee grounds, seaweed, eelgrass, which is a kind of seaweed, food scraps, various manures, and even use potting soil. So this photo shows a collection of materials ready to be composted. Okay, we've got comfrey leaves and what I call stable scraps, like manure, kitchen scraps, fresh grass clippings, brown leaves, coffee grounds, even stale bran flakes that I found in the pantry kelp, and 
animal manure. Looks like fun, huh? Kind of like setting up an orchestra. All right. Step number two. Step number two. Toss your ingredients together. You want to make your pile all at once. This is very important. This is one of the major problems with compost that does not get hot. You don't want to randomly toss stuff in the corner of your yard, like you see in this photo. As a friend of mine who lives in London, she says, Marion, that's just a rubbish heap. You don't want to just throw materials on a heap in dribs and drabs over weeks, months, or years. It'll take a long time. Thing is, in order for the compost ingredients to heat up sufficiently, you need to provide microbes with a decent home that we saw earlier. You need to give them a home. We're talking about an enclosure that's at least three by three by three feet square or cube. Is that right? Which one? I don't know. So I cobbled together my first bin from wood pallets, remember? Otherwise, there's not enough mass to heat up if you don't have a large enough bin. So here's an example of what a good size bin would look like. It's basically three by three by three. And then you see there's bin boards or removable boards in the bottom of the, the picture here. Now I want to share a special note about compost tumblers. If you've been trying to get finished compost, like hot finished compost, using a compost tumbler, a rotating drum, or a standalone bin, you might have run into problems with getting the materials to even heat up. Well, at this point, you've realized that these chambers within rotating tumblers and so on, they don't meet that three by three by three foot minimum size and that the two are linked. So if your bin or tumbler does not heat up properly, it might be because it's not big enough. All right, on to step number three. Add water as needed. Now you wanna moisten ingredients as you add them to the pile, as you make your pile. Compost material should, what I call, sparkle with moisture, not sag with sogginess. Microbes need water to perform their biological functions, again, just like you and me. However, not too much or they'll drown. So you may need to cover your pile to protect it from drenching rains, snow, or the other way is from drying out. So you'll see that I've got covers here. This pink cover, which is just a piece of um, foam insulation with a hole in the middle. So I poke my compost thermometer through it. And there's actually three reasons to cover your compost bins or piles. Number one is to keep out that excess moisture, right? Rain and snow. Number two is sort of the flip thought of that, and that's to retain moisture, to keep moisture in if you live in a dry area. And number three, and this is what I love, you can, when you cover your compost pile with something like this hard foam or um, insulation or a carpet or a piece of plywood, it allows you to visually measure materials as they break down. It's like keeping track of the growth of your child or grandchild by making marks on the wall, you know, above her head. So this is an example of a compost shed. This is our compost shed. It has a slanted roof, and that's to keep the excess moisture out of the pile because we have big, big nor'easter winds that are that just driving rain and wind. And so this allows me to work in relative comfort, right? Now I wanna share with you a few secrets, okay? These are composting secrets for making compost. Secret number one, 
Mix your ingredients uniformly. Do not build in layers. I have found over the years that building in layers, like a layer of straw, a layer of manure, a layer of grass clippings, things tend to mat or felt, like make these hard or kind of impermeable layers almost, where it's difficult for moisture and heat to actually uh, efficiently move through the pile, you kind of hit the ceiling sometimes. And sometimes they just get to icky, like grass clippings, for example. They just turn into this felt that's very difficult to break apart. Secret number two, as you build the pile, you want to shred, break, bruise, uh, shuffle, whatever it is, the outside of the materials. And that increases the surface area. That's the number of entry points for bacteria and fungi to feed on. So this is very important. And actually, it's really good aerobic exercise. So on to step number four. Okay, you want to turn frequently. Remember this diagram, the path to hot compost, finished compost in six weeks, food, water, air. We talked about the home. Now we're going to talk about turning. And this involves also secret number three. Complete and frequent turning of your compost exposes materials to the air and it helps speed up that microbial activity. Composting is like burning. Air is used up rapidly in the process, especially in the beginning. So grab a pitchfork. Remember, turning the pile is good upper body workout. Now, after you build the pile, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you benefits of doing this in a graph in just a second. Secret number three is complete. Oh, I told you about that. After building the pile, follow this recommended turning schedule. Day two, so you make the pile on day one. Day two, you turn the pile and you check its temperature during the process. Day four, you want to turn it again, thoroughly. Seven, turn it again, again thoroughly, inside to the outside, outside to the inside. Day 10 and beyond, turn about every five days or so. Now, another way to know when to turn your compost pile, turn when the temperature starts to drop after reaching a peak. So here, I'm going to show you something very, very special. This graph I'm about to show you is going to give the benefits of building your compost pile all at once and turning your compost at regular intervals. Are you ready? Here we go. This is a graph that I created from four compost piles I made one year. The yellow column on the left shows how in seven days, you'll notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, by that uh, bottom row of numbers, seven days, 14 days, 21 days, and so on. So the yellow column shows how in a seven day period, most of the piles rose to 145 degrees and above. The temperature on the left is in Fahrenheit. I should move it to a, a Celsius scale as well. Anyway, the T's you see there indicate when the ingredients were turned. So it looks very much like a roller coaster. Now the blue one you see there, there's a blue line. It heated up just fine and it was not turned, and it just plummeted to 50 degrees and didn't finish. That was a pile of leaves, and it was just kind of an experiment to see what would happen when I made a bin full of leaves, plenty of microbes, it got hot within about five days, four or five days, but then it just cooled off. Alrighty, the best way to keep track of what is going on inside your compost is to use a long stemmed compost thermometer. Anything else is a guess. So if it's getting near Christmas time or your birthday, 
ask for a compost thermometer. Couple more secrets here. When your compost pile's temperature rises and falls quickly, like we saw in the graph, think roller coaster, right? And maintains good heat for a couple weeks, your ingredients mixture is spot on, perfect. Secret number seven, one of the huge advantages to turning your compost pile at regular intervals, that fluffiness decreases the chances of your pile from becoming anaerobic, like smelling bad, like rotten eggs. And that's good to keep the peace in your household and between your neighbors. Alrighty, that is four steps to finish compost in six weeks. Thank you for joining me today. And here's secret number eight. Happy composting, happy life. Cheers! Now what I want to show you are just a few wisdoms of composting. You can't really make it, that is, create it, compost any more than you can germinate a seed or make a tree. So I'll just scan through these. gives you compost, start a garden. Compost heals the garden from the ground up. Yay! Oh my gosh! That, I'm, I love those expressions. I think I, I think I should contact, um, um, Hallmark Cards. They need a special line of compost greeting cards, don't you think? <laughs> Okay, so remember, um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, and some of you have already sent in questions, but now what I want to do is dive in to what I, let's see here, here we go. I want to dive into what I learned last year as an experiment uh, when I was planting potatoes. It was just one of those special aha moments, and I decided to just run with it. So let's run with what happened, and I'm experimenting here with well, some kind of fun graphics, as you'll see, because, you know, I think in a way we're kind of um, overwhelmed with like tech stuff. So anyway, it'll be kind of low tech, high tech and kind of fun. So here we go. Have you ever wished that you could grow more stuff in a raised bed without compromising the plants as in making them more crowded. Today I'm going to show you an unusual but effective way to manage two crops in the same space at the same time using potatoes as one of the crops. It's an experiment I tried last year and I was so happy with the results. I'll be repeating it this year. I even gave it a name. S-O-S potatoes. That stands for sprouts on potatoes. Let me explain how I did it. And once you see how it's done, I'm sure you'll come up with ideas for how you can accomplish something similar in your garden. Okay. Let's do this. Now, I don't have a lot of room in my garden, but what I did last year is I designated one raised bed for this experiment. And you'll see that it's, it's actually covered with fishnet because sometimes I have little issues with birds, right? So I started by digging a trench 
down here. And then I planted what I call drop-in potatoes. These are smaller potatoes. They're, they're not as big as the ones that, you know, like about this size that you would use to cut up and then plant. Instead, I use these little guys and they're called drop-ins. And I learned about drop-ins from, well, a potato scientist in Palmer, Alaska. And he said they're much better because they're less susceptible to rot. When you cut up a potato, even though you might heal them over the cut areas, and he preferred to use the drop-ins because he says people usually forget about these guys and don't even bother with them. But I've used drop-ins ever since. Now, when your potatoes pre-sprout like this, that's a good thing. And this is called chitting. No, it's not a swear word. Chitting your potatoes. Anyway, so I then planted the potatoes in the trench and then I hilled it up. After that, I planted on top specialty seeds. These are great mixes. Anytime you see mescaline mixes and mustard mixes and braising mixes, these are just like those fancy greens, these small specialty greens you buy in the store for an arm and a leg. And Renee's Garden has some great varieties like this uh, stir fry mix here. Oh yeah, winter greens. This is a great one. And that's because I really like radicchio. But look for cut and come again. Whether it's, it's, it's mustards, you know, or kale mixes. Anyway, all these are great to plant on top. After a while, the greens start to grow. I figure about two to three weeks. Two to three weeks before the potatoes will pop up from the bottom. Okay, now here's a side view of what we're looking at. Here are the greens growing on top and then down below buried in the soil and so on. These are the drop-in potatoes. And like I said, I got about two or three weeks before they reach the top. What's important to do though is to stay very aware and check on the plants. So what I do is I just, um, peel away or push away as I harvest these greens and lo and behold there is a little potato shoot that popped up. Here's a side view, excuse me, here's an end view of what it looks like at the bed, the end of the bed, and there's that little potato shoot. This is a little late, but me, you know, this is the first time I've ever done this before and I learned my lessons and I'm all set to try it again next year. So as I harvested, pulled away and harvested these greens, right? Then I wanted to make way for these shoots coming up. And you can see where, oops, I'm sorry. I cut those guys' heads off. Now, where did I put all these greens that I cut off? The compost pile. Yes, the compost pile. After I pulled all the greens, you can see the potatoes coming up. And this is what the harvest looked like. So the mixed greens are pulled away, the potatoes continued to grow, and oh my gosh, I got a great harvest. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the garden. <laughs> How do you like that little haircut I drew for myself? Woohoo! I actually did comb my hair before this, so interesting stuff. And um, I learned a lot. Did you guys catch my little foible there? I said SOS potatoes and I said uh, sprouts on potatoes. It's supposed to be sprouts on spuds. So, oh, well, that's the way it goes. Um, remember, if uh, you have any questions, and um, I'm going to dive in here in just a second. And um, with the aha Q&A, here we go. And I've got some too. So drop them in the chat. And I'm going to dive in here and answer some questions. Anything goes. It can be anything. It can be, you know, what is life like in Alaska? Or 
um, anyway, it's, it's, it's all, all open here. Um, okay. Um, my friend suggested I buy a plastic composting unit, quite expensive. Can I really produce compost without having to spend a fortune? Yes, you can. Um, there are many plans out there on the internet for, um, you know, making, you know, a rotating bin, if you like. But hey, when I made my first compost bins out of, um, you know, two sides was a fence and one side was pallets. It's pretty basic. It's pretty easy. You don't have to go as deluxe like our three bin system. But, you know, you got to start somewhere. And that's what I did. And it worked. And I was excited. The one thing you want to avoid, though, is just putting it on the ground, exposing it to the elements, be it, you know, sun to dry it out or um, heavy rains to wash it out. So that's really important to remember. Um how do you keep your veggie scraps? Eva says, hi, Eva. How do you keep your veggie scraps um, while you wait to begin your compost all at once? I have a tumbler type compost bin. This is great. And it's a great question, Eva, because I go through the same thing, even though I have a three bin system, three bin system. Uh, I get a rubber type tote with a secure lid. That's one way. And then I just put the scraps in. Now, what you want to do is don't just keep putting in food scraps without layering it with some sort of um, fluffy material like carbon material, uh, shredded newspapers, leaves, that kind of thing. It sounds like I'm making a worm composting bin, and in a way I am. So that's one way you can do it. But And I put them in these, these Rubbermaid totes, even during the winter. And what I do in the fall, the previous fall, is my husband and I go out and we collect lots of leaves, lots of leaves, like big bags of leaves, and we put them underneath our deck. We might get like 15, 20 bags of leaves. And for us, it's like money in the bank because when I have my food scraps and I cook from scratch, so I have a lot of them, and I'm putting them in that tub, I put the handful of leaves on it. And then when it comes to making compost, whether it's in a bin system or a rotating drum, you're all set. The other thing I do in the winter in particular, and I've got a video on this, uh, making compost during the winter on my YouTube channel, but I will set aside a bin out of our three that's blank or empty. And I put our food scraps in there. Again, I fluff it up with leaves so it doesn't go icky. And actually compost is happening. The composting, met, you know, microbes are on it. Leaves have a phenomenal amount of microbes and bacteria that are already working on it. We even tell our B&B &B guests where to put their food scraps. So that's a really great question. All right, I have, uh, let's see here. Um, somebody had asked about, all right, what is the minimum temperature for transplanting seedlings outside? For me, here in Alaska or in cooler areas like Minnesota, when you're waiting for spring to hit, wherever you are, the minimum temperature is about 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, having said that, there are plants that do fine in 40 degrees, your cooler, your, your kale, you know, your Brussels sprouts, but probably not peas. Things you want to germinate, like carrots, I... Personally, I wait till it's above 45 degrees. So that's a really good question. Here's a question that came in, everybody's favorite, sort of. How can I keep, cat, keep cats out of the garden? How can I keep cats out of the garden? If it's your cat, then you're going to have to either put up a fence or um, some of that mesh you saw when I showed the video of the raised bed. That's um, a fishing net, and in this case, it's shrimp web or shrimp netting. So the openings are only about an inch, if that, and that's why I can keep the birds out. But it keeps cats out, rabbits, uh, deer to some degree, and then when I'm not using it, I just roll it up and I just store it in the garage. Now, the other thing that's a little touchy is if it's a neighbor cat or a feral cat, number one, have a conversation with your neighbor, right? 
Number two, this is what I've had to do because sometimes we have feral cats is I will go to um, the pound or the city and oftentimes they'll give you a live trap. So I've actually had to do that. It's not a happy thing, but there's, I have to keep animals out, especially when I've got things planted like young uh, onion seedlings and so on. I don't want them digging around or birds. All right, here's a question that came in. Do you really need to cut potatoes before planting. And I kind of covered this a little bit in the video, but um, you don't have to. You know, you can put the whole giant potato in if you want. You're gonna have a you know a bunch of, of plants. Now remember, potatoes are not particularly a root crop. Think of it as a stem crop. And so um, that's why, you know, if you get your potatoes to chit like this. The long, it's along the stem that you're going to get your potatoes forming. So if you do cut your potatoes, make doubly sure that the soil temperature is such or they're not going to rot and that they heal over. They, they harden over in the cut area. You know, you want to make sure too that you've got an eye or two. And I don't cut them very small back in the day. You know, I made my cuts so I had big chunks like that anyway. I just wanted to be on the safe side. But just make sure that things heal over well. Yeah, Eva, um, usually use two tumbler type compost bins. So I just want to bring up one thing, a follow up with, with Eva, is um, I talked to the representative in Canada of a, a very, very well known composting tumbler units. And he said, you know, it's unfortunate in the industry that there isn't enough um, valid instructions given to people with these units. They're kind of like um, one of those uh, Nordic tracks. There's probably a million Nordic tracks out there. You know, people just kind of burned out on it, didn't work, work or something. Anyway, he says, so what I do and I tell people is like, put all your ingredients in all at once. If the ingredients are damp, don't add any water. If they're dry, add a little bit, but not much. And you need to rotate it, but here's the trick as far as adding food scraps and other ingredients during that composting process. And that is whether you're working in a bin situation or in a tumbler. If you have a six week period, where you want to get finished compost in six weeks. Only put food scraps in your, your bin for the first two weeks. After that, the temperature is starting to cool down where it won't be able to process those scraps. So that's why once you start your compost, you've made your whole batch, right? Like topping it off like an ice cream cone, because it's going to reduce by half, then when you have your scraps two week period, put them into a bin, just keep them off to the side. When you get ready to make another one, you're set. So that's great. All right. Um, oh, somebody had asked this last time I did a, a live, but this is really great to know. If you have slugs or snails and or your kids get into playing with slugs i know i did when i was a kid things can get a little slimy and so try as you might you cannot wash it off that's because slug slime has that magic ability to attract moisture otherwise they dry up like raisins and die so the easiest way to get the slug slime off your hands is to get some of that uh, boraxo that powdered uh, boratine granular soap people would put in their laundry and you just rub your hands with it and it peels up and psh, done. So, and by the way, scientists are actually studying slug slime because, well, I don't want to spoil it. it it's really, really phenomenal. There you go. <laughs> Here's another question. What is the best, the best size for a raised bed? This is an excellent question because I am five foot three and my raised beds aren't any wider than four feet, four feet wide. The reason is because I 
need to be able to um, reach in from both sides without having to step on. I see your question, Penelope. So I'll get to it in just a second. This is great. Um, I need to reach in from both sides. You don't want to step on the raised bed. You don't want to compact that soil in a raised bed or even a landscaped area as much as possible, especially your lawn. If your lawn is wet and soggy, don't tread on it because what you're doing is compressing. Remember we talked about those highways, whereas 50% of healthy soil is water and air. This is how nutrients travel in the soil beneath, beneath your feet. You step on it, you compress it, it makes it very difficult for microbes to get their food and so on. So Penelope says, how do you keep moles and voles out of your garden? I'm going to give you a two-part answer here, Penelope. Um, I have a friend in California, uh, just outside of um, Santa Cruz, and she has to line all her raised bed beds with heavy mesh material okay it's just she says i i have it all i have i have moles i have i have raccoons all these digging kind of animals so the other the other answer i'm going to give you which is more esoteric and it's becoming more how should i say accepted and that is to establish a relationship if you will and and work with the animals okay so having said that here here's a book i encourage you to read all of you who are listening to this there is a book called kinship with all life and it was written well the story true story took place during a silent film era it's extraordinary i highly recommend it i read it in 20 21 when I had COVID and I think I've read it probably three times now and I've actually bought the audible version. It's just so touching. So it's how we as humans can co-create with not just, um, uh, I mean, be co-creators with and friends with and have kinship with and relationships with animals, insects, um, even earthworms and microbes and plants. So I'll leave you with that one. Okay. <laughs> it's a challenge for you. There you go. <laughs> Alrighty. If you don't have any more questions, I'll be signing off. I thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope the rest of your week, happy Mother's Day. And I hope the rest of your week goes just fabulous. Okay. Cheers. And you guys are awesome. Thanks very much.